All right. Um, so a bit of a smaller crowd than we, than we expected, but thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm Steve Manzik from uh, Duo. Um, welcome to our very first London Tech Talk. Um, I hope everyone uh, enjoys. A uh, few uh, quick things. Um, restrooms are around the corner um, near the elevators uh, where you came up. Um, everyone found the pizza and there's snacks and drinks in the fridge. Feel free to help yourself. Um, we are going to make these a regular occurrence um, out here at the London office. So if you have fun tonight, I would encourage you to please, you know, tell your friends, tell, you know, all the other geeks and hackers that, you know, that you know to uh, come out and join us. Um, the thing we do with these tech talks, being the first one, um, they are marketing free. No one here is to sell you anything. Um, it's just all about learning about, you know, cool ways to hack stuff or cool technology. Um, um, if you check our YouTube channel, we have a lot of the past tech talks that we've done out of our US office, and there's all kinds of interesting, interesting stuff on there from you know, IoT device hacking to car hacking to um, you know, legal issues with hacking, I mean, all kinds of stuff. So uh, definitely check it out, and I uh, hope to see you guys next time we have one. Um, one more thing as well is we do typically use these as recruiting events. So Duo is definitely hiring, um, as well as out here in our London office. So check out our website for uh, open positions, and um, you know, feel, feel free to apply if there's anything there that interests you. Um, quick thank you to uh, IOActive, who uh, lent us uh, POW here to give us uh, what looks like it's going to be a uh, very fun talk. And go right ahead, man. Thank you very much. Uh, so today we're going to, to see a little bit of reverse engineering, not, not very hardcore reversing, but uh, it's reversing about an uh, old arcade game, Super Street Fighter 2X. Uh, well, I'm Pau Oliva, uh, I'm security consultant with IOActive and I have been doing mobile stuff for, for quite a long time. Started with uh, Windows Mobile, Windows Phone, then switched to Android when Android came out and I did a lot of Android uh, security research. Um, Grab the mic if you don't mind actually, just so we can hear you a bit better. Uh, no, the one, the one in front of you. Oh, yeah, this yeah, one. Yeah, that one there. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. Okay. <laughs> so I've been doing a lot of uh, Android security research in the uh, past years, and uh, well, I also happen to be a fan of Street Fighter since I was a kid, and so I joined my two uh, passions, uh, playing fighting games and reverse engineering, and this talk came out. <laughs> Uh, how many of you have you played have you played a Street Fighter before? Anyone have never played it? <laughs> okay, so I need a volunteer to come here at the stage and fight with me. Go for it. Who wants to go? Come on. Go for it. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Go on up. <laughs> Are you cheating in this game or? Uh, <laughs> put this here so everything is safe. <laughs> You're player one yep. and player two. <laughs> so, if you notice here, uh, the time never ends and the energy never ends. It refills itself when one hits the other guy. So thank you very much for coming and playing. We can do a real match later if you want. So this talk will be about uh, what has happened to reach this 
uh, cheat or this uh, state from getting a real arcade boat board to, to here. Can I take this out? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, um, first thing will be a, a about the CPS2, which is the hardware platform, the actual arcade board that uh, this game originally ran. Uh, and then we will talk about the, the game itself, about debugging and patching the game itself. And then uh, some things about uh, CPS2 and Radar2, which is a reverse engineering framework, uh, which now has support for, for CPS2. So this is the uh, Capcom Play System 2. It consists of two boards, the A board and the B board. The A board is like a console, and the B board is like the cartridge of the game. If, uh, they are uh, put one on top of the other, and it has a JAMA connector, which is the Japanese standard for arcade cabinets. And it has, through the JAMA port, it has everything. It, it has the inputs. That, that come from the sticks or from from the uh, from the sticks of the cabinet and the buttons. It has the power, so it it has 12 volts and 5 volts minus minus 5 volts. It has the RGB uh, output for the screen, which is a CRT screen. Uh, it has the sound, mono sound through the JAMA. Uh, and these boards also have a couple of RCA connectors, so it can have a, can do stereo sound too. Uh, the CPU is a Motorola 68K at 16 megahertz. For the sound, they, they use a Z80, and the display is a very small resolution, as you can see. So this is why we play this on CRT. If you play this on a, on a modern LCD or LED uh, TV, uh, the TV has to do upscaling to convert it to, to an HD resolution. And the, the upscaling, the conversion of something analog to something digital and upscaling it uh, totally breaks the game. It introduces a lot of lag, uh, display lag. And, uh, for competitive play, this is totally unacceptable. So if you play this at home with your friend, it's okay, but uh, for for competitive playing, it's not not good. So this game is meant to to be played on a on a CRT TV. A little bit of history. So the first system that Capcom released was the CPS One, uh, but the problem with the CPS One was that uh, they had a lot of piracy. There were a lot of uh, uh, bootlegs or uh, unauthorized copies and also modified copies. Maybe some of you remember what was called at the time the Rainbow Edition of Street Fighter, which you can launch like five Hadoukens at the screen at the time with uh, Hadoukens doing like that. And uh, you can launch uh, sonic booms with guile at different uh, height. Uh, so it was a hack, and it was very, very popular, uh, and Capcom didn't like that. So uh, what they did was releasing a second version of the CPS-1, which was the CPS-2, uh, which was pretty much the same hardware, a little bit faster processor, uh, but they introduced encryption in the in the EPROMs that, that have the, the, the game code. Uh, so the first Street Fighter released in the CPS-1 was Street Fighter 2. There was Street Fighter 1 before, but nobody really played it and it wasn't famous at all. Uh, then in 1992, they released Street Fighter 2 Dash, or Champion Edition, uh, which was the same as before. With they introduced mirror matches, so you can play uh, Guile Guile or Ryu Ryu 
So you can play against the same character. It was not possible in the other version. And uh, the four final bosses, you, you could select them in this version. You, you couldn't in the previous one. Uh, and then <coughs> in December 1992, they uh, released the two Turbo, or also called Hyper Fighting, which is the one in that TV. Uh, so what they did in there was they were preparing for this one, for the new challengers, but it was not ready. But the market was full of the bootlegs, of, of the unauthorized copies, which were better than Champion Edition. So they had to do something to attract the users back to their uh, original game. So they just made this one faster, but doing frame skipping. So one of every uh, three frames was skipped, so the game was really fast, which was the same method that the ball layers were doing. So it was, it was cool. Uh, and they introduced some uh, hacks into the game that were just ugly hacks in the code, but this was what after uh, was uh, w was uh, finally a combo system. Because they, they didn't have a combo system, nobody thought uh, about combos in the game mechanics, but due to the way that they programmed that, it was possible to do, to, to chain attacks together. And this was what later was converted in uh, combos. Um, and then in 1993, they released the, the new challengers, which introduces four new characters, Kami, Feilong, DJ, and T-Hawk. These four new characters were really uh, good, really uh, well appreciated by the the gaming community, but they did a very big mistake, which was going back to the speed of Champion Edition. So at this time, people were already used to the speed of, of hyper fighting, and they didn't like that this game was slow. But as I told you, the, the speed here was just a hack to, 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 be, uh, to match the competition, which was the illegal copies. So when they released this, uh, it was not the perfect game. So the perfection arrived here in 1994 when they did this game with the speed of this game. And then for the anniversary here, for the, yeah, for the 10 year anniversary, they, they did the hyper fighting where you can select uh, characters of Old, all the older games, but uh, it was okay. But competitively, it never uh, catched because it was totally unbalanced. So there are like uh, the guile from Champion Edition or the uh, dictator or Bison. I, I say detect dictator and boxer because in the Japanese version they have the names switched. Uh, so Guile and Dictator of, of this uh, game are overpowered and are very top, top tier. And uh, so this was totally unbalanced and it's not, not good for competitive play. So the perfect game and the, the one that is still uh, being used competitively today is the Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, as it was known in Europe and the States, or 2X. This was known in, in Japan. Uh, so how did they protect the, the CPS2 games? They uh, actually encrypted the ROMs and put the decryption key in RAM. And they put a battery so that the RAM is always powered. Is it? So if the battery dies, the encryption key is removed from RAM and the game never boots again. It doesn't power up anymore. So this is known as the suicide battery. Uh, you can see here the picture of the PCB with the battery on it. 
So these batteries usually last five to 10 years. If you have the board, you have to replace them uh, usually every five years to, to be safe. And it was, uh, the, the protection system was undefeated for quite a long time. So if you remember, the first CPS2 was released in 1993. It, went, it was not until uh, 2001 that uh, they were able to obtain uh, differential XOR tables. So uh, they didn't really uh, were able to dump the decryption key. At, at this point, uh, they thought that Motorola made a special processor for Capcom. It was not a regular 68K. So they thought that the, the opcodes were uh, different from the regular Motorola 68K because they were encrypted, but they did not know that. So what they did was a translation of the encrypted opcode to a normal uh, opcode so that the games could run on, on an emulator. But these, uh, these differential tables were specific for every game and it, uh, it were eight gigabytes of information for every game at a time where a normal hard drive would have 10 gigabytes. So that means that you need to have one hard drive for your regular operating system and one hard drive for just one game. So emulation was possible, but was not ideal. Then in 2007, uh, the uh, main author, uh, together with uh, another guy, uh, were able to to, uh, to to really understand what was going behind the scenes, and they they understood that the encryption only affected the opcodes, not the data, and it was a FaceTime network. If you, someone is into maths, might might know. So it was a four-round FaceTel network with a 64-bit key. And this algorithm was implemented for all uh, CPS2 games in, in main. So encrypt, uh, at, at this time, emulation was possible without the differential tables. And, and you just needed the ROMs, which are like a uh, few megabytes. Uh, here is the memory map of the CPS2. There are two important things here for to understand the next things. Uh, the battery memory is here is uh, on the 4000 to 4008, and the the main memory for the game is uh, starts at FF000 until the end. So if your board dies, your battery dies, and, uh, and you cannot run the game anymore, you want to revive the game. Uh, the method that was published at the time was, was the one explained here. What you would do was to decrypt uh, all the, the encrypted opcodes and, and get a fully decrypted ROM, then patch all the reads and writes to this uh, 400 whatever position, which is where the encryption key is, to patch them to, instead of go there, go to the bottom of the normal work RAM, which was starting at FF00. So you, you just uh, patch them to go to the very bottom of the normal RAM. Uh, then if there are some uh, memory clearing routines that clear the very bottom of the normal work RAM, you just have to patch them to make sure that they don't clear this region. And, uh, and if there is any part of the game code that uses this region, uh, patch it to use a different region. This usually doesn't happen, but it happens on a couple of games. And then you just reprogram the EPROMs with the decrypted ROM images. Uh, remove the battery, and so we, together with the battery, 
there is a small capacitor here. So this here, this is uh, here so that it holds uh, charge for a while. So you have time to to change the battery, to remove it for five minutes, most, and put a, a new one. Uh, and the RAM is still powered with that. Um, and then uh, after removing the battery and shorting the, 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 the two leads of the capacitor, uh, you just boot the, the game. And if uh, everything was done properly, the game will boot and run unencrypted. So you don't have to actually do this yourself. There are two um, projects that have done that for all CPS2 games. Uh, one is the Phoenix Edition, uh, which is created by Razola, a guy from Finland. And it includes some patches, like you can change the region of the game. So if you have a Japanese board, you can run the, the game that was meant for US or Europe. Uh, or you can switch to the regions, whatever. It has a jukebox where you can listen to all the uh, samples, like music of the game. And it has some other, like for example, for Super Turbo, it has a free play on the Japanese board, which the Japanese board doesn't have normally. It's, you always have to put coin. So they, they patch things like that. And then there is the Avalanche uh, project, which are also decrypted ROMs, and they have nothing extra. They are clean. So some purists prefer to have this instead of this because it has less patches, so it, it's more close to the real uh, original game. Even none of those is the original game because both are decrypted. So the the decrypted boards are usually half of the price. Boards that have no battery are usually half of the price of a board that have a battery because they are for purists, for people that really like the uh, original hardware well preserved. They have not, not the same value. Uh, so in uh, earlier this year, there was a team of people who were able to successfully reverse engineer the, the CPS2 security programming and put back the key in RAM. So if you have a board that doesn't have battery, you can uh, put the encrypted EPROMs and reprogram the security on the board to put the, the key in RAM again and, and have it uh, like an original board like it, ha it, like it has never uh, lost the battery before. This was published September la last month. Uh, and this is done with an Arduino one. And you have to put some pins on the arcade board and use the, the suicider, which will put the, the, the key in RAM again. So as a recap, in 1993, the CPS2 was released. Eight years later, the XOR differential tables were released. 14 years later, the encryption keys were obtained. And 23 years later, the security programming was reverse engineered. So it's not like nowadays that Sony releases a PlayStation and the next CCC, they hack it. <laughs> it took more years. Also because there is not, not a huge community going after that. But, but it worked well for Capcom. I mean, they wanted to stop people from hacking it, and they really did it. Because these systems doesn't offer any value for Capcom anymore. So now we are going, we talked about the CPS2, which was the platform. Now we are going to talk about the Super Street Fighter 2X, which is the game. Uh, to debug it, for me, the, the easiest way is to use MAME, emulate it, and use the MAME debugger. So you start MAME with minus debug flag, and you press Control M or Command D on Mac to open the memory window. At this address, FF844E, 
is the, the base for player one. So from here, you have everything that player one does. So if, if it's moving, there will be one byte that will change. If it's uh, hitting punch, there will be one byte that will change. If it's being hit, there will be one byte that will change. Everything, his position on, on the screen, his uh, hit boxes, everything uh, is at this address for player one. And the offset for the um, player two is adding 400x to, to this. Uh, so this is how it looks like. You have the game, you have the uh, debug window with the disassembly in there, which you see in real time, and then the memory window, which you see in real time what's going, what, what's going on, what's changing. Um, there is also the possibility to uh, do scripting with Lua in main, uh, and you have a lot of uh, functions that allow you to read uh, byte or a word in memory, uh, write, and then also some uh, functions to, to do on-screen display so you can modify what, what's on screen. Uh, and you can do that frame by frame, so it's very powerful. Uh, this is just an example of a, a, um, a program in Lua that will look for for a position in the player one and the player two and will tell you if you have to block high or block low depending on the attack that the opponent is doing. So for um, main there are two types of cheats. The RAM cheats which change the, the, the data that the game has in RAM uh, so change the value of a fixed memory address and ROM cheats, which is just patching the, the, the assembly of the game, the program code. Uh, usually RAM cheats are easy to write and you can write one with a session of uh, the main debugger and ROM cheats require a bit more understanding of the, of the game assembly. Uh, so this is an example with the main debugger. Uh, it's a video. So what I explained first what we will do here. So we will try to find, you see there is a 54 in the timer. So we will try to find uh, w what is the address in RAM that this 54 is. So if we put a 99 in, the, in that address, the time will always be 99. So it, we will have infinite time. So uh, main has the cheat command. First, first thing we do, we look at the 55, uh, is a cheat init command. So th this makes a snapshot of the, of the RAM, of, the, of, of what's in every byte, in every position. Uh, then we do a go, so the game runs again and we stopped it at 53, one second later. So now we, we will list all the values that have decreased in one in memory. So cheat next minus one means decreased by one. And with a cheat list, we will get the list of all these values. So as you can see here, there is one that was, the start was, uh, 54 and now is 53 and is at FF8DC. So this is the value you are looking for. There are other values in memory that also have decreased by one, but you don't want them. Uh, so the, well, this is just the same screenshot as, as before. Um, the main cheat for that uh, would be this XML. So the description says infinite time, and when the script is run, the uh, address at FF8DC will be always 99. Very easy. In here, the main CPU is the uh, CPU which you are attacking with this, uh, with this cheat. 
it's usually main CPU unless you are playing with audio, for example, that you will do audio CPU, but 99% uh, of the time you would put this. Uh, the P is the memory space that you are poking. It can be program right, region right, RAM right, opcode right. So for, for RAM cheats, you always use P. And for ROM cheats, you use M, unless they are, they are uh, encrypted ROMs, like in this case, where you would use O. The, the, the others are not commonly used. Uh, and then the V is the size. Uh, so it, the V is for a byte, W for a word, whatever. So here we just change the byte at this address to be always 99. Uh, another example for infinite energy, this is a different address, but the way to come up with this address is exactly the same as we have seen with the debugger, doing the cheat init command and uh, hitting the opponent looking for something that has decreased. Uh, and the, the, the full uh, meter, the, the energy bar, it's 90, so 144 in, in decimal. So you, if you put a, a 90 there, it will be always full. So this is infinite energy for player one. Same hack, infinite energy for player two would be adding 400x to that address, so it will be FF8878, all right? Uh, so there, I have a, a GitHub repo with a lot of uh, cheats for this game, if you want to see them. Uh, now, this is very easy to, to do, but this is only useful for RAM cheats. They only work on an emulated environment. If you want to hack the real arcade board, this doesn't work. So how can you do ROM cheats? For ROM cheats, it's very useful to use the watch point feature of the main debugger, which basically uh, tells the debugger, tell me the, where is the, the instruction pointer every time that this memory value is being read or is re written. So this is what you do with a watch point. You, you put a, well, this is also a video where we will put a watch point and we will do the same with the energy. So in the, in the, um, in the cheat before, I show you how, how to put a, a 90 here so the energy bar will be always full, but this is a RAM cheat. If we want to do a ROM cheat, we, we will start with a watch point. So at this address, at the uh, FF, 8478, which was the address in RAM. We'll put a watch point here. So everything that writes to here, the debugger will notify us where the program counter is. So this is setting the, the watch point. And now we just have to hit the other guy. Uh, Usually we hit like we we hit him with a normal, we throw him, we hit him with a special, we do a combo because there might be some parts in the code which handle the the energy different. So you have to do all the possibilities. As you can see, the meter has decreased from started with 90 and then went to zero. It does some weird values when the round is changing, and then it will. <coughs> it will go to 90 again when the other round starts. And you can see the values there. So when uh, the round starts, is, is 90 again, then uh, it's decreasing with, uh, with every hit. And you can see it's always just two or three different, memo uh, different uh, program counter positions. So if you disassemble, the game and go to these positions, you, you will see the disassembly, the, the code where the, where the energy uh, meter value is changed. So after that, you need to patch that in the assembly code. And you said, okay, I don't know anything about Motorola assembly. I probably did on the university 10 years ago and I don't remember. But 
it's very easy. So a knob, no operation, which you probably want to do when knobbing something, when you don't want that instruction to happen, it's a 4E71. Then there, there are the, the branches, like the conditional jumps. Uh, there is usually the branch if equal and the branch if not equal, which will jump if a, a previous comparison is equal or not. Uh, so they start always with a 67, branch if equal, and the branch if not equal starts with a 66. So if you just put a 66 where there was a 67, you will invert it. And the same for, for the branch if not equal. Put a 67 where there was a 66, it will invert the condition. Uh, and with these three things, you can patch most of the things. So here is a real example of the code. You see a branch if equal in there. It starts with 67. The 1A is how far the jump goes. So if you, instead of a 67, put a 66, it will be a branch if not equal. Uh, so to be able to, to obtain the decrypted opcodes, uh, until now, there was only a tool which was named Xcopy, which was released by a Japanese guy in 2007. The official website was geocities.japan, but that doesn't exist anymore. And to find it, you need to Google for a while, find really weird forums, and then get a copy of it which has, which has some special surprise inside, virus or something. <laughs> Uh, so it's difficult to obtain, difficult to obtain it without virus, uh, and it, it has some limitations. So there was no proper tool to decrypt and re-encrypt until now. Uh, so I added support for uh, CPS2 cryptography in Radar2. Basically what I did was take the decryption algorithm from main, uh, and add it to the Rahash2 library. Um, and then, <coughs> at this point, so MAME only does decryption because it doesn't need to encrypt. It just decrypts the ROM and runs it, the decrypted opcodes. So, uh, in Radar, we have encryption and decryption. So we can decrypt, patch, and then re-encrypt. Uh, for, for the... Uh, encryption support, uh, all that was needed to do was to invert the FaceTime network. I looked at that for maybe four days, wasn't able to do it, asked help for a friend who knows more about maths, and he just came up with a solution in 10 minutes, and I was like, oh my god. Uh, so to invert the FaceTime, you just invert the numbers here on the S boxes, three, two, one, and on the other ones are swapped. So it was so easy, but I was hitting my head on the wall like crazy. Uh, so when you have the decryption and encryption support, don't forget to write test cases for the rather two regression repository, otherwise someone will break your code in, in the future and it will not work anymore. Uh, so in this example, we will do the same as we have seen in, in the video before, uh, which is uh, patching the, the timer to have infinite time. But instead of just putting a 99 in the RAM value, we will do it in the code. So here we have that the timer value is, is set as 69. And here we have the register D0, which has a 68. And in this part of the code, the, there is a move which takes the value on D0, which is the 68, and will put it in the memory value, which, which is read to print the, the timer here. So it will take this 68 and move it, so the timer will decrease from 69 to 68. So as you can see here, this move instruction here has two bytes, sorry, four bytes, 
uh, and the um, knob was too wide. So we need to put two knobs in order to remove that move instruction that is the one that, that, that is moving the value from the zero in there. So uh, I will uh, show you that with a demo, which I think is easier. I copy the key because I don't know it from. So I uh, create a temp folder. Extract the ROM. So I start rather to the eyes for the architecture. Oh, sorry. Architecture is Motorola 68K, and with write uh, to be able to modify the file. And now the file name, which is this. So if we uh, disassemble here, you see that this is, makes no sense. So rather is disassembling it, but it's not proper uh, assembly. It has a lot of line F, line F, move, 40, whatever. It's not, not, not good. Uh, so w what we need to do is uh, to decrypt it, because this, those are the encrypted opcodes. With the W, O, we have W, O, D for decrypt and uh, W, O, E for encrypt. And W, O, D, these are the hashes and encoders and crypto algorithm. And we have here the CPS2. So um, let me copy the key again. Uh, we want to decrypt the, the whole file, so we need to change the block size to be uh, the same as the file size. So now the block size is this, the, the whole file. And now I use the WOD to decrypt with the CPS2 and the decryption key. And now the disassembly makes more sense. Looks like something different than before. So now we can analyze everything. Like this will. Uh, it is like the auto analysis of IDA. It will do the, the uh, find the cross references and uh, try to uh, find the prolog and uh, epilog of functions to identify what's a function and what's not and everything. So now, if we go here, we ha we can browse the function list. And uh, if we go to a function, we can see the, the graph with the true and false uh, jumps. So in this case, there is a test here. Uh, if uh, there is a branch if not equal, which is true, will go here. And is if, if it's false, will go here. So we got a proper disassembly. We got uh, uh, something to work with. So for uh, this, 
we are going to this address, which is the the address where was this that we found with the debugger, the, the move that we were talking about before. Uh, and if we put it here, we have here this move. Um, so if we write two knobs here, the move is not there anymore, and we have the two knobs. So now we go to six zero and we have to encrypt the game again with the same key. So to just to verify it doesn't make sense anymore because it's encrypted. And now we just recreate the zip file with a patch. And if we run main, it, it should complain. Yeah, it complains about the checksum error, but it's a checksum just in main, not because it detects that the ROM is not, not, not the proper dump. So now the time is always set to ninety-nine. So we have just did a ROM patch that we can write in a in a EPROM and have this run in a real arcade board. Uh, so for a real training mode hack, you would have to do this process, but not just for the timer, for more things. So I have a, a another demo which I will run scripted, not, not interactive, to, to be quick. So basically, uh, instead of doing it using Radar2, we use the Rahash2 tool, which decrypts CPS2 with this key, uh, and uh, then patch the, the decrypted file and then re-encrypt the file again. This is done for two of the files in the, because it, you need to patch two EPROMs uh, and then it does the, the zip file again with the patches. So if we run the game, You see the super bar is full from the beginning, the time is not moving. And the energy should refill in a while. Yeah. So now the energy is refilled. So you
if you launch the super, the super meter is also refilled. So it's a proper training mode that can run on a real arcade board. And Uh, Did you do it for both supers or do you share a super bar? Because both of them are flashing. Yeah, but one is for player one, the other is for player two. Both are refilled. This, this, actually, this, this uh, training mode patch was written by Jet Possum, this, this guy. Just, uh, I used it for, for the demo. And so, uh, as a final demo, I, I did a, another training mode, which is very similar to the one we have seen, but it just uh, it's meant to be run emulated, not on a real arcade board. Uh, it's, uh, it has the same features that we have seen, so infinite time, infinite uh, super, uh, live refill, uh, and it has some of the glitches that the, the other uh, one has fixed. And it also allows you to record uh, and replay macros, so it's good to, to train. It al al allows you to, to display your inputs, so you can see if you are doing execution errors or mistakes. Uh, you can see the hitboxes and uh, you can modify the, uh, what the, the other dummy character is doing. Uh, I will show you. So here we have an input display. When I move the stick, when I press buttons, punch, low punch, medium punch, high, high punch, low kick, medium kick, high kick. Uh, so here, in the cheat option, I start the training mode. And I set the player to action to be neutral, stun, and to never get dizzy. So this is when he casts the birds or stars around the head. And the super for player one to be infinite. Uh, the background to be the guile stage, for example. And yeah, that's it. So here we can see the, the hitboxes. So what is blue is uh, what can get damaged, and what is red is the active part of the attack. So if the red part of my, uh, my attack touches the blue part of the other character, it will decrease the energy bar for the character, but as we are in training mode, it will refill. The, um, the green parts are non-overlapping parts, so my character cannot cannot go, uh, cannot touch, so the two green boxes cannot overlap. And the white uh, boxes are for throws. So to be in a throw range, the, the, the two uh, white boxes need to overlap. And so you, you can also disable it or enable if you want. Same with the uh, input display. And you can have the, the guy to block everything. Or just to block ground attacks. So if I attack from the ground, it will block. But if I attack from the air, it will not. As you can see now, it, I did a combo, which was started from the air. So this, this is good for training combos that, stare, that start from, from a jump attack. Uh, 
you can have the guy to always jump. This is good to, to do juggle attacks or to jump forward or jump backward or to stay always crouching. Also good to train combos that start with the opponent crouching. Something like that. Uh, yeah, whatever. And, or to have the guy throw you. So you can practice a counter throw or tech, tech throw. And that's it. Uh, future work that needs to be done. <coughs> there is a hardcore value in the Radar 2 code, which will work for most of the games, but not for all the CPS2 games. So I need to fix that. I still haven't looked at what's the best option. Uh, also support for CPS3, which is the system that comes after that. I have read that the encryption of CPS3 is easier, but I haven't looked at how it works yet. <coughs> Then also I'm um, working on a tournament mode patch uh, that will have some of these features. That is something that in tournament play, uh, sometimes you have a, a the, the person who wins, uh, the, the character stays locked. And when you switch players, the player who enters doesn't want to play with that character. So when you are in the character selection screen with a tournament mode patch, you would be able to choose the character every time, and things like that. And that's it. If you have uh, questions, you have six seconds left. <laughs> so you edited the ROM and changed the game slightly for this game. Can you use the same method for other Capcom games? Yeah, you, you can use the same method for every game that it's supported by MAME because the, the debugger is from MAME uh, <coughs> and the, <coughs> the encryption uh, in Radar is just for CPS2 games, but uh, you can use that for every CPS2 game. But um, some of uh, games that are not from Capcom like Neo Geo games or other platforms have their own things, but usually if the if the underlying processor is supported by your tool of choice for uh, disassembling and debugging, you can apply the same methodology for, for everything. Cool. So what's next on your to-do list once you've cracked CPS3? Oh, nothing yet, probably not, not working on games anymore. <laughs> So bonus questions, how many hours have you spent playing Street Fighter? Too many, countless. What's your tournament ranking? Sorry? What's your tournament ranking? Oh, uh, we don't actually have a, like rank, ranks uh, yet. I'm working on a system to, to have ranks uh, online. Uh, so that probably answers your previous question. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, and we, we will use the ELO rating system, which is the system which is used in chess, which you have a number, and if you win someone that has a bigger number than you, your number increases, and we will use this system for, for fighting games too, uh, for online matches. But uh, I, I don't have a rank. But I won a tournament this past weekend in Spain, a small tournament, 19 people. Same technique to extend the game so you could play it over a network or over the internet? So, um, one of the here, <laughs> this point here says developer of Fightgate. Uh, Fightgate is a platform that uh, is for uh, playing fighting games, well, not, not fighting games, uh, arcade games online but most of them are fighting games, <clears throat> that I started uh, two years ago. And basically, it uh, hooks the emulator. Uh, it uses FB Alpha, which is not MAME, it's another emulator, 
but uh, what it does is uh, you have a chat uh, and a list of people connected to the chat and there is a room for every game. We currently support 200 games, but um, in the next version we will support more than 800. Uh, and you see a list of uh, people connected to the chat and, and they have three states uh, available, away or playing. If they are playing, you can watch the match that they are playing live. Uh, if they are av available, you can challenge them and if they can decline or uh, accept the challenge, if they accept, you start playing against them. You see the, the name, the flag of the country, and the ping that you have with them. So when the smaller the ping, the better the game will run. And it uses a, um, a protocol which is called GGPO, uh, which is, um, is, uh, is done to try to uh, hide lat latency. So what it does is um, the emulator has a function that allows you to, to save the game at any state. When you save the game, you save the, the memory state of the RAM and you um, save the state of the CPU registers and, and everything. So when you restore, the, uh, restore a, a saved game, you, you restart from the point where you saved it. <clears throat> so. Uh, in this uh, protocol, what we do is we uh, save the state at every frame and we transfer over the network a diff of the previous frame. So then the network uh, cost is very little and uh, what you do is you play locally in your, in, with the state of your local emulator and you transfer the state of your emulator to the other emulator over the network and if it has changed, so if something is different, you do a rollback. Depending on your ping, the rollback will be very small. So it, it will be uh, maybe one frame, two frames, so it will be not noticeable for the human eye. So it tries to hide the, the latency. <coughs> and it also does a uh, input prediction. So it means that if in the current frame your opponent is holding right but you have not received what your opponent is doing, you assume that he will be holding right in the next frame. <clears throat> so it kind of predicts the input of the opponent. And when you hold right like this, you have probably hold right for 15 frames with just this. And over the network you have a latency of three or four or five frames. So uh, it's actually a good good uh, input prediction uh, doing it like that. It's simple and it's, it's quite effective. So it's good for, for playing uh, fighting games online which require very little latency. And it's good for playing old games that were not thought uh, with net play. Uh, they were not designed with Netplay in mind when, when they were done. So that's it. If you want to play, uh, you can. So I just have the server with the, the, um, that holds the rooms for all the games. And then the games, you have to obtain them yourself. I don't distribute the games. So that's it. Okay. Any more questions? Sorry, we can ask something. No? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks everyone for coming out. Um, like I said, hopefully uh, you know you you enjoyed that talk. I definitely thought it was uh, really interesting. Um, and uh, you know, like I said as well, we're going to start doing these on a more regular basis. Um, we will use the uh, Meetup page that we use for the other Duo Tech Talks and Twitter and things like that. So uh, keep an eye out uh, for our next one, um, probably be in about a month's time or so. Uh, thanks again. Um, help yourself to any pizza that's left and beer, and of course, uh, you know the Duo swag that's uh, over there on the table. Um, thanks, everyone. <laughs>